My ex-wife was in a car accident and lost her memory. She turned into a 20-year-old girl. Her memory stopping just at the point when she loved me the most. Alex. So 10 years later you're my husband. Lisa jumped off the hospital bed, surprised and delighted. She ran up and hugged me tightly. Am I dreaming? Oh my god. My crush actually came true. I stood there in shock as she hugged me. But all I felt was a sense of desolation. Lisa. You forgot. We got divorced last month. I said softly. And you were the one who cheated. Chapter 1. During the new year. While everyone else was full of joy. Only I. The fool. Was waiting miserably at the entrance of the Civil Affairs Bureau. I waited the whole day. Until the staff went off duty. My ex-wife still didn't show up. Damn it. She was the one who proposed the divorce. The agreement was signed. And now she plays hide and seek when it's time to finalize the procedure. What's the point? My eyes were burning with anger as I frantically called her phone. But her phone was always off. It was getting dark. And the Civil Affairs Bureau was closing. There was no way I could get the divorce done today. I walked dejectedly to the parking lot. Ready to drive away. Just as I started the car. My phone rang. Hello. Are you a relative of MS? Lisa. This is the first people's hospital. MS. Lisa has been in a car accident. Chapter 2. Great. The divorce didn't go through. And now I get a scam call. I didn't hesitate. Yes. I'm Lisa's husband. Is she about to die? Don't waste medical resources. Just give up on her treatment. Yes. I said it. I'll take full responsibility. You can go ahead and push her into the morgue. The person on the other end was stunned. MS. Who only has a fractured leg. The doctor sounded very young. Probably inexperienced in dealing with patients' families. He was obviously unnerved. We've already put a cast on her leg. Could you possibly come over? He was vague. I frowned. Finding it odd. And politely declined. No need. A fracture is no big deal. I'm very busy. So I won't come. Oh. He sounded disappointed but asked. Also. MS. Who was in the accident with Mr. Victor? We can't reach Mr. Victor's family. Do you know him? Hearing that name. I became alert. I know him. What happened to him? He's seriously injured. With extensive bruising. His hand might be disabled. And he'll have significant scarring. I'll be right there. I shouted with joy. You're at the first people's hospital. Right. Which floor? Which room? I'll be there in 20 minutes. Doctor, we're on the fifth floor of the second campus. I hung up immediately and floored the gas pedal. The black SUV shot out like a shark, merging into the bustling traffic. After receiving the call, my mood brightened instantly. Yes, my ex-wife broke her leg in a car accident. Who cares? But, the pretty boy disfigured in the car accident, and possibly disabled, such good news doesn't come often. How could I miss such a show? Chapter 3. When it came to Lisa, I was indifferent. But hearing that Victor was disfigured, I ran all the way, even taking the stairs to the fifth floor, too impatient for the elevator. I was really anxious, afraid I'd miss it. The doctor couldn't believe I arrived so quickly, beaming with excitement. I burst into the room, where's Victor? How's his hand disabled? How big are the scars? Let me see, let me see. Everyone in the room stared at me, looking awkward. I wasn't embarrassed at all, I only felt joy, where is he, where is he? But the next second, the bed curtain opened. Lisa lay there with her leg in a cast, looking at me, puzzled and unsure. My expression darkened immediately, but she looked at me, her voice trembling and confused. Are you, are you Alex's brother? Me. I sneered. I'm your father. For some reason, this hit Lisa hard. She clutched her head, pain on her face, and lay back down. The doctor pulled me out of the room and explained. MS. Who has a concussion, causing memory confusion? She knows general knowledge but claims she's 20 years old when asked her age. I wasn't paying attention. The doctor noticed. Mr. Victor's room is on the sixth floor. He's still in critical condition. You can see him through the glass. Without a word, I rushed up. Everyone was left staring at each other. When I finally reached the sixth floor, I saw Victor. I saw with my own eyes the pretty boy who ruined my marriage. Now lying there wrapped in bandages. His right hand twisted awkwardly. His once handsome face now a mess. Out of humanitarian concern, I felt a bit of pity. But remembering what he did to me. My humanitarian concern vanished, and I was not a good person. Chapter 4 When I returned to the fifth floor, I pulled out the cash from my wallet and started giving out red envelopes to everyone present. Yes, I wanted everyone to share in my joy, and they indeed felt it. The doctor's hand trembled slightly as he held the money. Mr. Ming, the patient's condition is a bit complicated, and our medical facilities here are limited. I waved my hand dismissively, full of bravado. She thinks she's 20, then she's 20. No big deal. I think you guys are great. Treat her. Even if it goes wrong. I won't complain. Everyone was speechless. The room fell silent. They had nothing to say. The room had doctors, nurses, and Lisa's secretary and lawyer standing in the corner. They desperately turned away. 
trying to avoid my gaze. I laughed. I have no say in Lisa's treatment. Finally, I admitted to the doctor, although we haven't completed the legal formalities, we've signed the divorce agreement, and I can no longer represent her affairs. These are her assistant and lawyer. I pointed to the corner. The people I pointed to shuddered, unable to face me, trying even harder to hide. I said, you can discuss it with them. The secretary and lawyer were utterly submissive. Seeing them like this, I found it hilarious. You helped with the divorce, but you're just employees. I pulled out a cigarette, placed it between my lips, and bit down without lighting it. I smiled at them. Don't be afraid to face me. I'm not a bad guy. The secretary stood there awkwardly, wanting to disappear, and the lawyer, who looked young and somewhat old-fashioned, blushed at my smile. Mr. Ming. Her face turned red, and even her wire-rimmed glasses couldn't hide her embarrassment. She said to me, you didn't have to come. Hmm. I was very easygoing and nonchalant, I'm about to leave anyway. Hearing this, the curtain around the hospital bed was suddenly pulled open. Lisa, having endured another bout of headache, was awake again. The secretary quickly approached her. This goo, whose memory was stuck at 20 years old, looked around, ignoring her confidence. She looked at me, bewildered and dazed. Alex, how did you become like this? You look, well, a bit older. I touched my face. Yeah, after 10 years, who wouldn't age? I didn't bother arguing with this potential lunatic and turned to leave. Suddenly, there was a loud noise behind me. Lisa, dragging her cast-bound broken leg, tried to get out of bed but fell. She fell to the ground, frantically crawling towards me, screaming, Alex, don't go. The secretary tried to help her up but was pushed away. This goo, with only 20 years of memory, didn't recognize her close aides at all. Her face was full of confusion, misunderstanding, and urgency. I don't even know you guys. Leave me alone. Alex, wait for me, take me with you. She lay on the ground, shouting towards the door, utterly alone, desperately calling out for her lifeline, don't leave me. Chapter 5, I was already out of the hospital room, hearing the commotion, I turned back in shock, Lisa was a hotshot tech tycoon, she built her business from scratch, became famous at a young age, and by 25 or 26, she was already a well-known CEO, everyone addressed her politely as MS, who, with fame came her severe aloofness being difficult to get along with, keeping everyone at arm's length. Now, she was sprawled on the floor, completely losing her composure, desperately crawling towards me. I suddenly went back, squatted in front of her, and asked, do you really only recognize me? Who am I? Lisa grabbed my arm without hesitation. She was terrified I'd run away again. She answered fluently, you are Alex, you live next door to me, your dad is named Ming Bo, your mom is a high school teacher and you are severely allergic to peanuts and seafood. If you eat even a little, you swell up immediately. This, this was spot on. My mouth twitched. You, you think you're 20 years old, right? Then think about it. When we were 20, we were in our sophomore year. Look at your face now. Do you look like a college student? Lisa touched her face and then looked at me. For some reason, her face turned red. Me, I heard the doctor call you. Lisa sat on the floor with her broken leg, her expression serious and solemn, but her gaze on me started to drift. I know I'm not 20. When I saw you, I knew I must have hit my head and forgotten the past few years. She clutched my arm and finally said, You, you're my husband now. I didn't say anything. At that moment, I felt exhausted. After all, before coming here, I had waited all day at the Civil Affairs Bureau, witnessing countless couples getting married, and many couples parting with hatred. There, I told myself that when Lisa and I separated, I must not be like them, filled with love and hate. In the end, I must be dignified. I care about my reputation but I didn't expect Lisa to risk her life, recklessly driving at high speed, and crashing into the guardrail with the pretty boy. So I stood up, because Lisa was gripping my arm tightly, refusing to let go. I had to pull her up with me. Lisa, with her leg in a cast, stood on one foot. She looked warily at her secretary and lawyer, like a wounded beast separated from its pack. To free myself, I pulled the secretary over and said to Lisa, You are Lisa, 30 years old. You are now the founder and CEO of Changshu Technology Company. This is your secretary and legal counsel. You can trust them. Lisa looked at them, frowning. I smiled and said, although you don't remember, congratulations, Lisa. By the time you are 30, you are indeed very successful. But she just stared at me. She asked, how long have we been married? I answered patiently, five years. Lisa did the math, and her eyes started to drift again. We got together right after college. So, do we have any children? I paused. Yes. I said calmly, but, at four months, we lost it. Lisa took a step back, my words hit her like a needle, causing her to instinctively release my arm and start shaking, but she didn't even understand why she reacted this way. She stood there, bewildered, 
shaking violently. A sudden pain overwhelmed her, tearing her heart apart, making her lose control. I. She held her head in pain. Alex. Our. I. I watched coldly, indifferent, until Lisa collapsed again, clutching her head. I stood with my hands in my pockets, watching her trembling on the hospital bed, her face twisted in pain, tears streaming down her face. Doctors and nurses rushed to her side. Everyone was caught off guard. Amidst the chaos, I told the secretary, please reschedule with the Civil Affairs Bureau. We'll do the procedure again next Wednesday. The secretary looked at me in panic. She hesitated but didn't know what to say, and I had already turned to leave. Chapter 6 I got married when I was 25. The timing was neither too early nor too late. It happened just when we were at our poorest. At that time, I couldn't scrape together even a hundred dollars. So, I bought a $58 strawberry cake, lit candles on it, and proposed to Lisa with it. It wasn't simple. It was downright shabby. Other people's love culminates in flowers, diamond rings, and romantic dinners. But we only had this cake. We crammed into a rented apartment, eating the cake until our faces were covered in frosting. Still hungry after the cake, I went into the kitchen to cook instant noodles. The kitchen was tiny, filled with steam from the boiling pot. Lisa suddenly walked in and said, why don't we get married? I was stunned for a moment and said, sure. So, we finished our noodles and went to the Civil Affairs Bureau the next day to get our marriage certificate, becoming legally married. We grew up next to each other, childhood sweethearts. My heart, like hers, went from youthful ignorance to maturity. There were no unforgettable first loves, no pretentious coquettes, and no surprise third wheels. We were soulmates, fighting side by side. Finally, at 30, my company secured several projects through technology and investments flooded in like the tide, we seized this opportunity and became new city elites. At 31, I caught Lisa and her male secretary in bed, our marriage shattered on the spot, right there, in my own home, Lisa lay on the bed, still hungover, unaware of what had happened when we barged in, I directly poured a bottle of mineral water on her face, Victor, wrapped in a towel, was cornered in the bathroom by my friends, one man, three friends, seeing so many of my buddies, he was panic-stricken, almost begging for mercy, it, it was MS, who who asked me to accompany her, he stammered, I'm just an intern, how could I refuse the boss, seriously, my friends rolled up their sleeves, ready to teach him a lesson, if I had known you had this talent, I would have transferred you to the marketing department, I smiled sinisterly at him, our client Mr. Wong likes young men, if you can't refuse others, why not do this right and get that deal, the year-end bonus is at least a hundred thousand, Victor didn't expect my logic to be so twisted, for a moment, he was speechless, seeing I was serious about using him. Victor clutched his towel and feebly defended himself. I'm truly in love with MS. Who? How low class a pretty boy. How foolish a person. At that moment, I almost laughed at his stupidity, but I couldn't laugh for long, because Lisa wiped her face, got dressed, and calmly got up from the bed to ask me for a divorce. Yes, she wanted a divorce, ignoring the loss of shared property, ignoring the company's operations. She was determined. Intent on getting my wedding ring off my hand within three months, she even packed her things and moved out that night. I made a scene, cursed, and even smashed the office, but our marriage was already in shambles. This severely impacted my mental state, leading to me being tricked by her trusted secretary during the divorce negotiations. The divorce agreement stated that the company had nothing to do with me. I could only take one third of the shared property, even the house my parents paid for. Lisa wanted half. I couldn't believe it, but it was too late. Everything was a mess. When I finally accepted reality and agreed to the divorce. This foolish woman, Lisa, had a car accident and lost her memory. Chapter 7. Lisa truly remembered nothing. All her experiences over the years evaporated. With a car accident, she achieved the saying, after half a lifetime, returning as a girl, company affairs, business dealings, all the mess. She couldn't understand any of it. The 20-year-old MS, who, stuck in her memory, could only solve quadratic equations, not run a company. She sat there staring blankly at the documents her secretary brought, but, she still remembered me, even I couldn't remember what I was like at 20, but 20-year-old 20 Lisa was so vivid and beautiful, it was hard to pretend not to notice, especially since she only recognized me, chapter 8, to be honest, the only thing that surprised me over the years was how thick-skinned Lisa's trusted secretary was, after all, during the divorce turmoil, this woman tricked me, this trusted secretary secretly helped Lisa transfer company shares, then used the board to oust me, I lost control and management of the company, along with many shares. I lost at least 50 million. Among all the shared property, I only got one third. Last time in the hospital, I was just being polite and pretended to be nice, but I didn't expect her to be so audacious. 
This trusted secretary actually brought Lisa to my house to block me, because Lisa wanted to see me, the secretary used me as bait, coaxing this very immature female CEO to participate in an important executive meeting. Then, she fulfilled her promise by bringing her to block me. Chapter 9, When They Arrived I was in the middle of moving, the same day I caught Lisa cheating, she moved out of our shared house, with the divorce imminent, I naturally couldn't stay there either, a friend found me an apartment, and I completed the purchase last month, most things were already set up, but I couldn't part with the good furniture in the house, so I planned to take it with me, after all, these belongings weren't cheap, and soon there would be a new man enjoying them, since that was the case, I might as well take them with me, so, when we met, the atmosphere was peculiar, the secretary was awkward, knowing she had cost me so much money, I felt guilty, as I was secretly moving our marital assets, this time, the secretary decided to take the initiative, she said to me, brother Ming, you know, I'm just an employee, each serving their own master, MS, who gave me a great opportunity, I couldn't mess up something so important, I rolled my eyes at her, yes, yes, the kindness of being taken care of must be repaid with utmost dedication, so I deserve this bad luck, she only lost her boss, but I lost 50 million real dollars, the two of us were whispering on the balcony, while Lisa had already toured the entire house, she saw the secretary and me whispering and couldn't stay calm, she walked over and pulled us apart, she pointed at the packed boxes and asked me, is this our new home, this house seems good, why are we moving, or are we moving to a bigger, more luxurious place, I looked at her, I'm the one moving out, you're staying here, Lisa didn't understand, I said coldly, because last month we agreed to divorce, the reason is that you cheated, chapter 10, I never expected Lisa's reaction, when she heard this, she was stunned for a moment, then burst into laughter as if she had heard the most unbelievable joke, she laughed heartily, her laughter was very cheerful, don't joke like that, 20 year old Lisa laughed, why would I divorce you, I looked at her, my expression very calm, there is no everlasting feast, even you and I will separate, that's impossible, she said it firmly, as if it were a matter of course, if you said we never got together, I'd understand, but since we got married, I won't separate from you, this made me laugh, because she had really forgotten many things, she forgot about the cruel, even harsh and very unfavorable property division for me, she forgot the cold, quiet, apathetic expression she had when she placed the divorce agreement in front of me, she forgot she told me with her own mouth, it's over, we both get relief, the Lisa whose memory stopped at 20 years old was like this, she remembered nothing, knew nothing, she blindly believed that being together with me meant we would never separate, so at that moment, malice surged in my heart, why did I always have to be the man who was hurt or wronged? No, I wanted to hurt her too, to make her feel pain. So, I asked her, why? Why do you think we wouldn't separate? Lisa looked at me. At that moment, the images of the 20-year-old and 30-year-old Lisa overlapped within her. But her gaze was so focused and serious. She said to me seriously, because I loved you for so many years. After all the effort to get you, how could I let you go? Chapter 11. When she said that, the room fell silent. The secretary's expression cracked, not knowing why her amnesiac boss was acting like a love-struck fool, madly confessing to her ex-husband. And I didn't say anything, because the 20-year-old Lisa indeed loved me just as she said. It was quite mushy. After saying that, Lisa herself couldn't handle it and quickly found an excuse to go check out the kitchen. The balcony was now empty, leaving just the secretary and me standing together. The secretary looked at my face, not daring to speak. Yeah, what could she say? Say, congratulations. Our boss has fallen in love with you again, or, sorry, our boss is not in her right mind, but the divorce process must go on. She couldn't say anything, nothing was appropriate, because this Lisa who loved me so much lived 10 years ago, now she just temporarily forgot our conflicts, no matter how beautiful the dream, it's still a bubble, when she remembers, everything will revert to its original form, the 20-year-old Lisa could love me unconditionally, but the 30-year-old Lisa's love had already worn away, and she found me detestable, even now with both versions of her overlapping briefly. Our marriage was beyond repair, but as I watched Lisa wandering aimlessly in the kitchen, I suddenly smiled. This smile was light and gentle, like a spring breeze, as if I was truly delighted, as if I was back in the days of our passionate love. Maybe the genuine emotions of the 20-year-old Lisa touched me. Not only did I stop moving out, I even invited her to stay for dinner, smiling warmly and diligently cooking. Yes, I looked at her with great tenderness, as if she was the person I loved most in the world. At first, Lisa was a bit taken aback by the attention, but soon she gathered the courage to get used to it. Yes, now it was ten years later. We had been married for five years. We were a married couple, having dinner together. What's wrong with that? Seeing her in a daze, my smile grew even more, 
The amnesiac Lisa is still Lisa. The Lisa whose memory is stuck at 20 is still Lisa. Since she is Lisa, she can amend legal documents. She can give willingly. Great, I thought. I know how to get back my rightful 50 million. Chapter 12. When we first started discussing the divorce, Lisa and I fought like crazy. It was really insane. We fought as if it were the end of the world. Since the company was built by both of us, splitting up caused turmoil. Even the employees had to choose sides. As for Victor, he was like the straw that broke the camel's back, becoming a pariah. But as I got tricked and lost control of the company, things changed completely. After all, circumstances were pressing. What happened to my marriage was my own business. The employees, no matter how much they sympathized with me, still had to make a living. They couldn't let supporting me affect their income. So, although they disapproved of Victor's actions, they tacitly accepted him as the next boss. Victor probably thought the same. Until today, when Lisa and I walked into the company hand in hand, everyone was stunned. Lisa at 20, was at the peak of her love for me, even though I was no longer the same naive schoolboy she remembered, no longer wearing a uniform. She still poured all her love into me, I was no longer that innocent boy. Over the years, I had faced many storms, and with my understanding of her, it was easy to make her infatuated with me again. No one expected this turn of events, but most of the employees were genuinely happy for us. After all, many were part of our original team and had witnessed our journey together. When our marriage faced a crisis, they genuinely felt sorry for us. Seeing us reconcile, they were truly happy, but not everyone was pleased. That included the secretary. She joined the company later, so she initially saw the worst of my relationship with Lisa. Now, she watched as the amnesiac Lisa acted like a fool, desperately trying to please me. The secretary thought her boss's mind was just temporarily messed up from the accident. She was very wary of me, fearing I would deceive her boss and do something to harm her interests. So, she tried to offer some harsh advice to Lisa. Lisa smiled slightly. Then she suddenly exploded with anger, slamming the table and kicking the secretary out of the office. They almost got into a physical fight. Chapter 13. What the secretary wanted to say was actually very simple. Summed up in one sentence, boss, this guy is not a good person. Lisa's thought process now was even simpler. If Alex is not a good person, then are you a good person? The veins on Lisa's forehead bulged. Her face flushed red as she yelled in the office. Not caring about her image, she was truly furious, I've known Alex for so many years. We're neighbors, do you understand? When I was 16, my parents ran away after accumulating debt, and I couldn't even pay my tuition. It was Alex who used all his pocket money to support me. He didn't eat breakfast every day, saving the money for me to eat. Lisa was so angry she was almost losing her mind, her eyes red, shouting, Alex's family wasn't wealthy either, and when his parents found out about this, they certainly blamed him for meddling. Alex knelt down and begged them, begged them to help me, to give me a chance. Saying this, Lisa gritted her teeth tightly, her face red with anger, but tears flowed down her face, crying. She said, why do you all keep telling me he's not good? In this world, he is the best person to me, I only have him. When I was 16, my mom gave me to the creditors, and they wanted to chop off my hand. Alex stopped them, saying if they wanted to chop, they should chop his hand instead. You say Alex is good to me now just to take over my company. Without Alex, how could I possibly have today's company? My belongings should all be his. The secretary, covered in spilled coffee, looked very embarrassed. I stood quietly outside the office, listening to the shouting inside. Passing employees heard these words and had interesting expressions. They couldn't help but sneak glances at me, as if watching the tragic hero of a play. They all remembered the turmoil of our divorce, the cheating, and the chaos we caused. Now. The brain-damaged Lisa was here, deeply emotional and furious, but when she was in her right mind, she had shown me no mercy, relentlessly trying to destroy me in the same place, no matter how deep the youthful love, this is how it ended up, I said nothing. Chapter 14 Lisa wanted to continue her outburst, but I knocked on the door, drawing everyone's attention, it's already 12 o'clock, I gave her a smile, what do you want to eat, I'm a bit hungry, hearing my words. Lisa immediately dropped her anger and the well-meaning but harsh secretary. She ran over to me and pulled me outside. Let's hurry and eat, she said. You often skip breakfast. You must be feeling unwell now. It's okay. I gently held her hand and said, they mean well for you. No need to get so angry. Mentioning this made Lisa angry again. They said you want my money and my company. I smiled very gently, even raising my hand to wipe the sweat from her forehead. And what if I really thought that? Then I'll give it all to you, Lisa blurted out. You're Alex, if you ask for something, how could I not give it to you? Hearing this, my smile grew even brighter. I even hugged her, I know. I whispered in her ear, Lisa, you're the best to me. Hearing this, 
Lisa almost floated with joy. She cheerfully pulled me out of the company, insisting on having a good meal. I let her lead, but took out my phone to send a WeChat message to my lawyer. The message was simple. Is the contract ready? The other party, a seasoned professional lawyer, responded without asking any questions. It's all set. No problem at all. It can be signed this afternoon. Seeing this, I put away my phone, feeling a weight lift off my chest. Who knew when Lisa's mind might suddenly recover? Better to act quickly, whether in business or marriage. Only the one who strikes first can laugh last. Chapter 15 Lisa thought that the 30-something me was mature and gentle. These years had changed me a lot, but when I smiled at her, she still saw me as her Alex. She was very curious about the blank years, constantly asking me questions. I was very patient, answering her one by one. In the beginning, we set up a stall and earned our first bucket of gold. I bought a broken machine from a scrap dealer, tinkered with it and fixed it. We used it to produce pirated music tapes and set up stalls all over the streets. Later, our business did so well that we expanded and hired a bunch of people to distribute the products for us. We made 50,000 yuan in the first week. In the elegantly decorated restaurant, I took a sip of lemon water. I spoke gently, but businesses like ours attract local thugs. We stumbled into their territory and broke the rules. A lot of people came to our house with steel pipes and machetes to find us. We had to give them most of our money before they were willing to leave. You were terrified then, crying so much, but I was afraid they would really cut your hand off. So I stood in front of you, trembling all over. Lisa believed every word, because I was Alex. These were things I could indeed do for her. She trusted me as much as she trusted herself, while speaking. I had already cut my steak and handed it to her, gentle and considerate, emotionally delicate, so she increasingly couldn't believe we had divorced. How could she divorce me? After so many years of weathering storms together, our love was solid from the start. We had been through so much together. If you told her that one day we would grow to hate each other, despise each other, curse each other, how could she believe it? How absurd. I glanced at my phone. My lawyer had already arrived at the company. Immediately, I put down my knife and fork saying I was full and had some unfinished work to handle at the office. Lisa cared a lot about me. Without thinking, she quickly finished her steak. What kind of work is so urgent that you can't have a proper meal? I'll help you with it. You can help. I said softly. I really need your signature. Lisa didn't think, didn't look, didn't even process it. She waved her hand. As long as I can help you, I'll do anything. Chapter 16. What do you call this? This is called a blessing from heaven. I spoke softly, showing care holding Lisa's hand tightly, crossing the street, I looked left and right, observing for five minutes before daring to take her across, in the elevator, I made sure she kept a meter distance from others, I was afraid something might happen, or something might hit her head, turning her back into the woman who cheated on me with her male secretary, ruining everything, the lawyer was already in my office, eager and ready, several contracts were neatly laid out, we had also prepared recording and video equipment to prevent her from backing out later, Lisa saw the setup, not quite understanding what was happening, but she could read the words on the contract. Words like gift, transfer, voluntary relinquishment confused her. She asked me, what's this for? I didn't answer her question, just gently cupped her face. I said to her, do you want to give me everything you have? Lisa was about to answer but was hit by a sudden sharp pain in her head. The pain made her dizzy, unable to stand steadily. She groped for a seat, holding her head, in agony, but I didn't let her go, still asking. Do you want to give me your belongings? Lisa was in severe pain, but she gritted her teeth and answered, Everything I have is yours. If it weren't for you, I'd be dead. My things should be yours. The lawyer and I exchanged glances. The lawyer quickly got to work. There were many places to sign on several contracts, and the lawyer had thoughtfully marked them in advance. He swiftly turned the pages, guiding Lisa to sign each one. Lisa, though in pain, feeling faint and nauseous, I coaxed her with a few words, even kissed her on the cheek. That did it. She was as energetic as if she had been injected with adrenaline, ignoring the pain and dizziness. Without looking, she signed rapidly. One person flipped the pages, another signed. Very efficient. Watching this, I felt very satisfied. Last time, when we went through this, Lisa and I even got into a fight. It took a whole month just to get the divorce agreement signed. But this time, Lisa signed all the contracts in five minutes. The lawyer quickly adjusted the recording and video equipment, and brought out a prepared script for Lisa to read. Lisa's head was splitting with pain, but she didn't want to disappoint me, didn't want to make me sad, gritting her teeth to endure, it was almost over, everything was going smoothly, too smoothly, soon, I would regain my assets, my company, my shares, and Lisa would be left with nothing, at that moment, the tightly locked office door was smashed open with a fire axe, chapter 17, the scene was quite shocking, 
With splinters flew as the door was violently broken down. We were all truly frightened inside, looking out, as expected. It was Lisa's trusted secretary coming to the rescue. Seeing the contract spread across the table and the recording equipment, the secretary went crazy. She knew it. I was not a good person. Considering the chaos I had caused earlier, my madness, that kind of hatred, anyone could see there was no room for reconciliation. Now suddenly, I changed my face, smiling, gentle and kind. Surely, I had ulterior motives. The secretary immediately broke through the door, rushing in to stop everything. Lisa, with a splitting headache, still stood up to protect me, shouting. What are you doing here? This nearly drove the secretary insane with anger, pointing at me in a panic. She shouted, Boss, he's deceiving you. He's after your money. Lisa rolled her eyes, but her headache was so severe that the expression twisted her face in pain. Seeing her boss was really useless. The secretary was burning with anxiety, but she was prepared. The secretary quickly opened the office door, pushing in someone in a wheelchair. Boss, do you remember him? He's Victor. The secretary shouted, He's your man now. Victor was obviously hastily brought from the hospital, still wearing a patient's gown. His wounds were unhealed, covered in bandages and gauze. A complete mess. His right hand twisted into a deformed lump. He was indeed disabled. Hearing this, Lisa's headache vanished. Her voice grew louder, and her temper flared. She was almost furious to death, pointing at Victor. She said, Are you crazy? You think I would leave Alex for him? This was truly heartbreaking. Victor looked at Lisa, knowing he had intentionally seduced her taking advantage of the situation. And deep down, Lisa didn't think much of him, but hearing those words still made Victor uncomfortable. He said, MS, who, I am sincere towards you, this pretty boy's level was really low, truly foolish. He kept saying the same thing. My ears were tired of hearing it. Lisa seemed to hear something utterly ridiculous. She even voiced her thoughts directly, in front of everyone, under the gaze of all. She mocked, pointing at me. I've known Alex for over 10 years, married for five and we've been through hardships together. You're telling me I would divorce Alex for someone like him. Can I believe that? Am I an idiot? What is he compared to Alex? But the eerie thing was, her words plunged the room into silence. Yes, Lisa's question was sharp and hit the mark. We had known each other for so long. Our bond was strong. Would we really split because of a low-level third party? Because of someone as foolish as Victor? No, the problems had started much earlier, between ourselves, and those problems were beyond repair. Chapter 18. The secretary opened her mouth. She couldn't answer that question. And while she was breaking down the door, I had already made a call. The head of the company's security department is a relative of mine. At that moment, a large group of security guards rushed in like wolves, directly grabbing the secretary and Victor, twisting their arms and pushing them out. Thanks to them, I managed to gain those crucial last 10 minutes. The lawyer, filled with professional spirit, quickly completed the process with Lisa, with the final red fingerprint in place. Everything was accomplished. The matter was settled. I was rich again. I gathered the contracts and the USB drive with the recordings and videos, locking them in a safe. Later, this safe would be deposited in a bank, where no one could access it, and the copies would be held by the lawyer to continue some remaining operations, ensuring I would fully receive what I deserved. Money, shares, the company, all of it rightfully mine. The 20-year-old Lisa was just young. She wasn't foolish. She understood what I intended to do with that whole process but she still cooperated. As she said, she truly believed those things were rightfully mine, because I was Alex. So when I asked her for something, she felt she had to give it, but she had a question in her mind. She looked hesitant, and asked me, was that guy really the pretty boy I found? Why would I find someone like him? She seemed to have heard something ridiculous, I already have you, why would I find him? You forgot, the matter was settled, I didn't bother lying to her anymore, I told her straightforwardly, we were doomed long ago, huh? I think it started when we lost my child. I looked at her calmly and said, Lisa, do you remember? My child was killed by you. Chapter 19. This was the first step toward the emotional destruction between us. However, the conflicts between us had already been very sharp before the child. Lisa once had a very happy and fulfilling family. Father Gu was a businessman, and Mother Gu was a music teacher who could play the piano. Their home was wealthy, warm, and harmonious. Mother Gu would sit by the window playing the piano. While Lisa and Father Gu played games in the living room, this scene stayed with her always, but then everything was gone. When Lisa was 16, Father Gu's investment failed, and he was left with a huge debt. Mother Gu chose to divorce him. The family was gone. Her father fled in the middle of the night, with no marriage to protect her. Mother Gu, who was still being chased by debt collectors, pushed Lisa out to bear the burden at the crucial moment. Mother Gu broke down, screaming that she was already divorced. He still has a daughter. 
doesn't he? Go after his daughter. All the problems fell on Lisa's shoulders. The creditors threatened to cut off one of Lisa's hands to force Father Gu to come back. Lisa's father never returned. What happened next need not be said. I became the most important person in Lisa's life. We supported each other, facing hardships together. And that's how we got to where we are today. On the day our startup saw some success, her father returned. Over the years, Father Gu had suffered a lot. When he came back, he even had a limp. Mother Gu had remarried long ago. She now had a new, happy family and even had children. In a way, Lisa's family was complete again, which made up for her regret. But at this time, her family faced a big problem. The son of an investor got along very well with Lisa, and their relationship was ambiguous. Faced with this win-win situation, Father Gu, as a businessman, was very eager for his daughter to seize this opportunity. After all, I was just a poor boy who started from scratch, but the other party was a genuine second-generation rich kid. Father Gu hoped his daughter could have a good life, but Lisa and I had already married in secret. We didn't reveal our marriage to the public to make our work easier. In the eyes of the public, Lisa was a successful and very beautiful woman. Who wouldn't want to see such an excellent woman? For many years, both Mother Gu and Father Gu felt deeply indebted to their daughter, especially after experiencing the ups and downs of the business world. Lisa had suffered a lot, enduring both visible and hidden hardships. She became silent, cold, and stern, and she kept people at a distance. In contrast, being with her, I became smooth, worldly, and adaptable. Our combination was initially very good, but the investor's olive branch was even better offering her a direct leap up the social ladder. Father Gu and Mother Gu certainly knew about our long-standing relationship. They just didn't know about our marriage. So, they talked to me privately several times, hoping I could give up Lisa. Mother Gu even used her own example to persuade me. She said that when Father Gu went bankrupt, he divorced her immediately to avoid dragging her down. Now she felt I should do the same and not hold Lisa back. How can one stop their lover from pursuing a better person? At that time, I had just finished a project working crazy hours for several days, completely exhausted. I sat in front of them, forcing a smile. I'm not stopping her from pursuing a better person. I'm stopping her from committing bigamy. They were utterly shocked. Without hesitation, I took out my phone and showed them a photo of our marriage certificate. A complete victory. Lisa is wonderful, but there are many wonderful women, I said. Even if she divorces me now to take a chance, being a divorced woman, they might not even look at her. Moreover, I built this company. If I leave, I will take half with me. This completely blocked all paths. Mother Gu and Father Gu were left speechless. It also made them have a grudge against me. Lisa loved me deeply, but I was not the son-in-law they wanted. For so many years, Lisa and I faced life and death together. From the bottom of my heart, I felt that I was not only Lisa's man but also her most important comrade. But Lisa's parents were traditional, believing in male superiority, thinking the husband should earn money while the wife should enjoy life at home. They didn't approve of me. On the contrary, they had even more resentment towards me. After the incident with the investor's son, they felt I had ruined Lisa. Why couldn't Lisa be a wealthy wife and enjoy a peaceful life? Why should their precious daughter have to work every day? The family was in constant conflict. Lisa's parents argued with me. Lisa argued with them. And I argued with Lisa. My parents even joined the battle. It was endless. My parents felt that after so many years, Lisa and I had endured enough hardships. My father shouted, You two abandoned your daughter and ran away back then. Now you come out acting all high and mighty. But Lisa's parents didn't see it that way. They thought I wasn't good enough for Lisa, looked down on me, and even wanted me to hand over half of my company to Lisa. The family crisis lasted for about three or four years. Even the best relationship couldn't withstand such torment. But one day, a turning point came, because Lisa was pregnant. She unexpectedly got pregnant and didn't want to keep the child initially. At that time, Lisa and I had already started to have a cold war. Lisa's mother had heart disease and felt I shouldn't be so tough on her. After Lisa got pregnant, her parents tormented me even more frantically, forcing me to transfer all my assets to Lisa and her parents, trying to make me give up everything. I refused. In the end, they chose the most extreme way. One day, after work, I took the elevator to the B2 floor of the company, ready to drive home. Suddenly, a group of people rushed out, covering my head with a bag and shoving me into a car. I had been in business for many years and had encountered retaliation before. Immediately, I fought back fiercely. During the struggle, Lisa's father hit me hard on the head, right at the temple. Blood flowed from my nose, and I fell flat on my back, my vision going white. Yes, I lay there helpless, unable to move. When I regained consciousness, I found everyone standing still. They all looked at me in horror. Their hats and masks had been torn off, revealing their true identities. They were Lisa's relatives, and there I was, lying on the ground, bleeding profusely from my mouth. 
eyes, ears, and nose, looking terrifying. He's going to die. Someone shouted in panic. You said to teach him a lesson, now he's going to die. No one dared to move again. In the end, it was the company security guards who took me to the hospital. My parents were furious. They had never been so angry. I was their only son. Back then, I insisted on being with Lisa and worked to help pay off her family's debts. Over the years, enduring so much hardship, they were already dissatisfied with Lisa. So after the incident, my parents directly called the police, uncompromising, determined to send Lisa's father to jail. At this point, Lisa knelt on the ground, begging my parents for mercy. Fine, I'll let them go. My mother, crying, sat by my hospital bed. Why didn't your parents let my son go? What did my son do wrong? Yes, he's not a rich kid. But how has he treated you all these years? Do you have no conscience? You ask me to spare your parents, but where were you when they were beating my son? Each word pierced the heart. Lisa knelt on the ground, trembling all over, her face pale, but she firmly said, that's my father, I can't watch him go to jail, if you don't let him go. I'll abort the child and divorce Alex. My parents went mad upon hearing this, what use was such a daughter-in-law? In the end, no one could persuade them otherwise. My parents steadfastly pressed charges against Lisa's father, refusing to reconcile. He was eventually convicted of intentional injury and sent to prison. And Lisa, true to her word, went to the hospital alone and had the baby aborted. Her heart was truly ruthless. Because of this incident, our feelings for each other faded. Endless arguments. Daily mutual torment. Not to mention her father was still in prison. How could we stay together? How could we face each other? How could we return to how things were? A broken mirror, shattered into countless pieces, could never be made whole again. Even if a deity descended, I hated Lisa in my heart, I hated her parents. We were doing well, but her parents insisted on picking on my ordinary background, disdaining me for not being a rich kid, and forcing me to transfer all my assets to them. Why should I give up everything just because her parents said so? I am not that kind of person. I, Alex, am a good man, but within me also flows fire, wind, knives, and evil. The situation only escalated and worsened. I refused to back down. I refused to forgive. In the end, we lost our child. Lisa lost her father again. We resented each other, blamed each other. So we argued, cursed, shouted, and raged. Our feelings died step by step, until finally, I caught Lisa and her male secretary in bed. At that moment, I only felt relief. Entrapped in this torturous relationship, I was already exhausted. Now, finally, an outsider entered and everything collapsed completely. Our marriage had finally come to an end. Of course, I never imagined that one day, I would see the young Lisa again, see the woman who loved me the most, because when we were young, we didn't know that one day we would end up like this, but now, everything can never go back. Chapter 20 As it turned out, my preemptive move was justified, because, just after I had taken all of Lisa's assets, Victor went crazy. He couldn't tolerate being publicly ridiculed by Lisa. Nor could he accept taking on a woman who had lost everything. Was all his effort for this? Lisa, with a splitting headache, groggily went out, heading to the hospital. Victor also needed to go back to the hospital. The secretary drove, and they both sat in the back seat. The car was silent. Seeing Lisa in such a groggy and painful state, Victor suddenly lost his mind. His hatred overwhelmed him. So he directly opened the car door and pushed Lisa out. While the car was moving, the door suddenly opened, and with a deliberate push, Although the speed wasn't high, the unprepared Lisa still fell hard. Luckily, there weren't many cars on the road, so she didn't end up under the wheels. But her head hit the roadside greenery hard. Are you crazy? The secretary slammed on the brakes, terrified. She yelled, Mrs. Who asked you to break up their relationship and make them divorce, not to kill her. But Victor, sitting in the back seat, began to laugh hysterically and maniacally. He laughed. That old lady asked you to kick Alex out of the company. Did you manage that? Madness. They're all mad. The secretary quickly got out of the car to help. Lisa was lying limp by the greenery. There was a pool of blood under her head. And her condition was uncertain. Chapter 21. Just after depositing the safe in the bank, I received another call from the hospital. Last time, Lisa crashed into the guardrail. This time, Lisa crashed into the greenery. I couldn't help but think it was impressive. And a bit stupid. I didn't want to go. But the secretary's frantic calls annoyed me. So I went. I thought maybe the 20-year-old Lisa was a bit difficult to deal with, and going to the hospital would ease her mind. So when I quickly arrived at the hospital, ready to calm her down, the curtain was pulled back, and I saw a pair of calm and tired eyes. I was stunned. Lisa lay on the hospital bed, her head wrapped in thick bandages. I stood a short distance away, not knowing what to do next, not saying anything, because for a long time, 
There had been nothing to say between us. In the end, I politely said, MS, who, long time no see, she said nothing, just looked at me with those calm, tired eyes, take care and get well, I said politely, next Wednesday, at the Civil Affairs Bureau, let's not have any more accidents, chapter 22, Victor was arrested, this was something I never expected, his crazy act led the police to intervene and investigate, and they retrieved the dashcam footage from Lisa's previous car accident, the footage recorded their argument, Victor was hysterical, while Lisa was dismissive. I also learned an important piece of information. Victor was hired by Lisa's mother. He was the son of Gu mother's best friend, determined to push me out and become the wealthy son-in-law. And the secretary was also employed by Gu mother. She had a premeditated plan against me, but Victor was a lunatic. On the highway, he grabbed Lisa's steering wheel. The car was moving fast. The direction shifted, and it crashed straight into the guardrail, then flipped over. Victor, being on the right side, was severely injured. This time, he went crazy again successfully getting himself into prison. Hearing this, my feelings were complicated. Parents love their children so much that they treat others' children like dirt. Maybe MS. Gu is just destined to have no good marriage. At this moment, we stood at the entrance of the Civil Affairs Bureau, holding our documents, waiting for our number to be called. I said sarcastically, all the men you've met are a bit crazy. Either work crazy or love crazy. Next time, keep your eyes open and find a rich, handsome second-generation guy to make your parents happy. Just wonder which poor guy will be unlucky enough to be your family's servant. Lisa's head injury wasn't healed yet. Wrapped in thick bandages, she looked a bit ridiculous. Inside the Civil Affairs Bureau, there were people getting married, people getting divorced, and a lot of laughter and arguments. My sarcasm was nothing. She looked at me, calm, tired, yet confused. Maybe her head was indeed damaged. As she suddenly asked me, do you hate me? I asked back, don't you hate me? She shook her head, no, I laughed. Then thank you, I said sincerely, after all, now you're the one leaving with nothing. And the next moment, to my utmost surprise, Lisa, looking at the marriage certificate in her hand, suddenly took my hand, her tone softened, cautiously and pleadingly, can we not get divorced? Can we start over? It's over. Her head was really damaged. My expression changed slightly. Did you lose your memory again? No, Alex, she said. At that moment, I thought I was going to die. My past flashed before my eyes like a lantern. It's my fault. Can we start over? Facing her request, I didn't answer. Instead, I asked her, Do you know what I was thinking when you had that car accident? Lisa shook her head, indicating she didn't know. At that time, I was sitting there. I pointed to a corner in the Civil Affairs Bureau, waiting for you for four or five hours, and you didn't show up. Do you know that? When I heard you had an accident and lost your memory, I thought, Why didn't you just die? Lisa froze. I laughed. If you had died in that accident, I would have inherited everything. No one would think I'm pitiful. If you had died then, it would have been the best ending. You ask if I hate you. How can I not hate you? I'm 30. Cheated on. Kicked out of the company. With no career and no family. I've suffered for half my life. Your parents mistreated me. Hurt me. And you. In our home. In our marital bed. With another man. You ask if I hate you. I wish you would die right now. I laughed hysterically. Tears almost coming out. Not knowing what I was laughing at. Maybe laughing at her stupidity and thinking she could come back. Lisa stood there, speechless, until the red marriage certificate was taken from our hands, and the divorce certificate was issued. I was satisfied, as I was leaving. I got into the car and saw her still standing there. I suddenly turned back and said to her, If you can't get over it, you can hate me. The extra share of the marital property I took is what you owe me. If you're not satisfied, sue me. These words made Lisa tremble. She looked at me, as if the 20-year-old and 30-year-old Lisa overlapped but her lips trembled, and she looked miserable. When we were 20, our love was strong, and at 30, we were still wealthy. Now, she had lost everything. From now on, I would completely leave her. She stood there, watching me drive away, not turning back once. So be it. The story isn't long, nor hard to tell. We met, but couldn't love. She would move on to her future, and I to my life. The greatest regret in the world is that we once started well but couldn't end well. Even though many years ago, when we were still young, we thought we could walk through countless mountains and rivers together, 